Chapter 5 of In the Field, 1914-1915. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. In the Field, 1914-1915, by Marcel Dupont. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Low Mass and Benediction. One morning, in the middle of September, 1914, as we raised our heads at about six o'clock from the straw on which we had slept, I and my friend F. had a very disagreeable surprise. We heard in the darkness the gentle, monotonous noise of water falling drop by drop from the penthouse roof onto the road. Arriving at Pevy the evening before, just before midnight, we had found refuge in a house belonging to a peasant. The hostess, a good old soul of eighty, had placed at our disposal a small bare room paved with tiles in which our orderlies had prepared a sumptuous bed of trusses of straw. The night had been delightful, and we should have been awakened in good spirits had it not been for the distressing fact noticed by my friend. "'It is raining,' said F. I could not but agree with him. Those who have been soldiers, and especially cavalrymen, know to the full how dispiriting is the sound of those few words. "'It is raining.' It is raining means your clothes will be saturated, your cloak will be drenched, and weigh at least forty pounds. The water will drip from your shako along your neck and down your back. Above all, your high boots will be transformed into two little pools in which your feet paddle woefully. It means broken roads, mud splashing you up in the eyes, horses slipping, rain stiffening, your saddle transformed into a hip bath. It means that the little clean linen you had brought with you that precious treasure in your saddle-bags will be changed into a wet bundle on which large and indelible yellow stains have been made by the soaked leather but it was no use to think of all this the orders ran horses to be saddled and squadron ready to mount at six thirty and they had to be carried out it was still dark i went out into the yard after pulling down my campaigning cap over my ears well after all the evil was less than i had feared it was not raining but drizzling. The air was mild, and there was not a breath of wind. When once our cloaks were on, it would take some hours for the wet to reach our shirts. At the farther end of the yard some men were moving about around a small fire. Their shadows passed to and fro in front of the ruddy light. They were making coffee, just, as they call it, that indispensable ration in which they soak bread and make a feast without which they think a man cannot be a good soldier." I ran to my troop through the muddy alleyways, skipping from side to side to avoid the puddles. Daylight appeared, pale and dismal. A faint smell rose from the sodden ground. "'Nothing new, mon lieutenant,' were the words that greeted me from the sergeant, who had then made his report. I had every confidence in him. He had been some years in the service and knew his business. Small and lean, and tightly buttoned into his tunic, in spite of all our trials, he was still the typical smart, light, cavalry, non-commissioned officer. I knew he had already gone round the stables, which he did with a candle in his hand, patting the horse's haunches, and looking with a watchful eye to see whether some limb had not been hurt by a kick, or entangled in its tether. In the large yard of the abandoned and pillaged farm where the men had been billeted, they were hurrying to fasten the last buckles and take their places in the ranks. I quickly swallowed my portion of insipid, lukewarm coffee, brought me by my orderly. Then I went to get my orders from the captain, who was lodged in the market square. No word had yet been received from the colonel, who was quartered at a farm in Vadeville, two kilometres off. Patience. We had been used to these long waits since the army had been pulled up before the formidable line of trenches which the Germans had dug north of Reims. They were certainly most disheartening, but it could not be helped, and it was no use to complain. I turned and went slowly up the steep footpath that led to my billet. Pevy is a poor little village, clinging to the last slopes of a line of heights that runs parallel to the road from Reims to Paris. Its houses are huddled together, and seem to be grouped at the foot of the ridges for protection from the north wind. The few alleys which intersect the village climb steeply up the side of the hill. We were obliged to tramp about in the sticky mud of the main road waiting for our orders. Passing the church, it occurred to me to go and look inside. Since the war had begun, we had hardly had any opportunity of going into the village churches we had passed. Some of them were closed because of the parish priests had left for the army, 
or because the village had been abandoned to the enemy. Others had served as marks for the artillery, and now stood in the middle of the villages, ruins loftier and more pitiable than the rest. The church of Pevy seemed to be clinging to the side of the hill, and was approached by a narrow stairway of greyish stone, climbing up between moss-grown walls. I first passed through the modest little churchyard, with its humble tombs half hidden in the grass, and read some of the simple inscriptions. Here lies, here lies, pray for him. The narrow pathway leading to the porch was almost hidden in the turf, and as I walked up it my boots brushed the drops from the grass. The damp seemed to be getting into my bones, for it was still drizzling, a fine persistent drizzle. Behind me the village was in mist, the roofs and the maze of chimney tops were hardly distinguishable. Passing through a low, dark porch, I opened the heavy door studded with iron nails, and entered the church, and at once experienced a feeling of relaxation, of comfort and repose. How touching the little sanctuary of Pevy seemed to me in its humble simplicity! Imagine a kind of hall with bare walls, the vault supported by two rows of thick pillars. The narrow, gothic windows hardly allowed the grey light to enter. There were no horrible, cheap, modern stained windows, but a multitude of small, white, rectangular leaded panes. All this was simple and worn, but to me it seemed to breathe a noble and touching poetry. And what charmed me above all was that the pale light did not reveal walls covered with horrible colour wash we are accustomed to see in our, most of our village churches. This church was an old one, a very old one. Its style was not very well defined, for it had no doubt been built, damaged, destroyed, rebuilt and repaired by many different generations. But those who preserved it to the present day had avoided the lamentable plastering which disfigures so many others. The walls were built with fine large stones, on which time had left its melancholy impress. There was no grotesque painting on them to mar their quiet beauty, and the dim light that filtered through at that early hour gave them a vague, soft glow. No pictures or ornaments disfigured the walls. The stations of the cross were the only adornment, and they were so simple and childish in their execution that they were no doubt the work of some rustic artist, and even this added a touching note to a harmonious whole. But my attention was attracted by a slight noise, a kind of soft and monotonous murmur, coming from the altar. The choir was almost in darkness, but I could distinguish the six stars of lighted candles. In front of the tabernacle was standing a large white shadowy form, almost motionless, and like a phantom. At the bottom of the steps another form was kneeling, bowed down towards the floor. It did not stir as I approached. I went towards the choir on tiptoe, very cautiously. I felt that I, a profane person, was committing a sacrilege by coming to disturb these two men praying there all alone in the gloom of that sad morning. A deep feeling of emotion passed through me, and I felt so insignificant in their presence and in the mysterious atmosphere of that place that I knelt down humbly, almost timidly, in the shadow of one of the great pillars near the altar. Then I could distinguish my fellow worshippers better. A priest was saying Mass. He was young and tall, and his gestures as he officiated were slow and dignified. He did not know that someone was present watching him closely, so it could not be supposed that he was speaking and acting to impress a congregation, and yet he had a way of kneeling, of stretching out his arms, and of looking up to the humble gilded cross in front of him that revealed all the ardour of fervent prayers. Occasionally he turned towards the back of the church to pronounce the ritual words. His face was serious and kindly, framed in a youthful beard, the face of an apostle, with the glow of faith in his eyes, and I was surprised to see underneath the priest's vestments the hems of a pair of red trousers, and feet shod in large muddy military boots. The kneeling figure at the bottom of the steps now stood out more distinctly. The man was wearing on his shabby infantry coat the white armlet of the Red Cross. He must have been a priest, for I could still distinguish some traces of the neglected tonsure among his brown hair. The two repeated in low tone by turns the words of the prayer, comfort, repentance, or supplication, harmonious Latin phrases, which sounded to me like exquisite music, and as an accompaniment in the distance in the direction of St. Therry and Beriou Bac, the deep voice of the guns muttered ceaselessly. For the first time in the campaign I felt a kind of poignant melancholy. For the first time I felt small and miserable, almost a useless thing 
compared with these two fine priestly figures who were praying in the solitude of this country church for those who had fallen and were falling yonder under shot and shell how i despised and upbraided myself at such moments what a profound disgust i felt for the follies of my garrison life its gross pleasures and silly excesses i was ashamed of myself when i reflected that death brushed me by every day and that i might disappear to-day or to-morrow after so many ill-spent and unprofitable days without any effort and almost in spite of myself pious words came back to my lips those words that my dear mother used to teach me on her knee years and years ago and i felt quiet delight in the almost forgotten words that came back to me forgive us our trespasses pray for us poor sinners it seemed to me that i should presently go away a better man and a more valiant soldier and as though to encourage and bless me a faint ray of sunshine came through the window itta missa est the priest turned round and at this time i thought his eyes rested upon me and that look was a benediction and an absolution but suddenly i heard in the alley close by a great noise of people running and horses stamping and voice crying mount horses mount horses i was sorry to leave that little church of pevy i should so much have liked to wait until those two priests came out to speak to them and talk about other things than war massacres and pillage but duty called me to my men my horses and to battle shortly afterwards as i passed at the head of my troop in front of a large farm where the ambulance of the division was quartered i saw my abbey coming out of the barn with his sleeves tucked up and his kepi on the side of his head he was carrying a large pail of milk i recognized his clear look and had no doubt that he recognized me too for as our eyes met he gave me a kindly smile my heart was lighter and as i went forward my soul was calmer for the last six days we had been quartered at montigny sur vessel a pretty little village halfway up a hillside on the heights twenty kilometres to the west of the rheims there we enjoyed a little rest for the first time in the campaign on our front the struggle was going on between the french and german trenches and the employment of cavalry was impossible for all the regiment had to do was to supply two daily troops required to ensure the connection between the two divisions of the army corps what a happiness it was to be able at last to enjoy almost perfect rest what a delight to lie down every evening in a good bed not to get up before seven o'clock and to find our poor horses stabled at last on good litter in the barns and to see them filling out daily and getting sleeker for our mess we had the good luck to find a most charming and simple welcome at the house of the good monsignor cheveret what that kind old gentleman did everything in his power to supply us with all the comforts he could dispose of and he did it all with such a good grace and such a pleasant smile that we felt at ease and at home at once madame cheveret whom we at once called maman cheveret was an alert little old lady who trotted about all day long in quest of things to do for us she put us up in the dining-room and helped our cook to clean the vegetables and to superintend the joints and sweets for gosset the bold chasseur appointed to preside over our mess arrangements was a professional in the culinary art and excelled in making everything out of nothing so with the help of maman cheveret he accomplished wonders and the result of it all was that we began to be envenerated by the delights of this new capua and how thoroughly we enjoyed it we shared our eden with two other squadrons of our regiment a section of an artillery park and a divisional ambulance we prayed heaven to grant us a long stay in such a haven of repose now one morning after countless ablutions with hot water and a clean shave i was going with brilliantly shining boots down the steep footpath which led to the little house of our good monsieur cheveret when my attention was drawn to a small white notice posted on the door of the church it ran this evening at six o'clock benediction of the most holy sacrament it occurred to me at once that this happy idea had been conceived by the chaplain of the ambulance for until then the church had been kept locked as the young parish priest had been called up by the mobilization i made haste to tell our captain and my comrades the good news and we all determined to be present at the benediction that evening at half past five our ears were delighted by music such as we had not been accustomed to hear for a very long time in the deepening twilight some invisible hand was chiming the bells of the little church 
how deliciously restful they were after the loud roar of the cannon and the rattle of the machine-guns who would have thought that such deep and also such solemn notes could come from so small a steeple it stirred the heart and brought tears to the eyes like some of chopin's music these bells seemed to speak to us and they seemed to call us to a prayer and preach courage and virtue to us at the end of the shady walk i was passing down whose trees formed a rustling wall on either side appeared the little church with its slender steeple it stood out in clear relief a dark blue almost violet silhouette against the purple background made by the setting sun some dark human forms were moving about and collecting around the low arched doorway perhaps these were the good old women of the district who had come to pray in this little church which had remained closed to them for nearly two months i fancied i could distinguish them from where i was dignified and erect in their old-fashioned mantles but as soon as i got closer to them i found i was mistaken it was not aged and pious women who were hurrying to the church door but a group of silent artillerymen wrapped in their large blue caped cloaks the bell shook out some solemn notes and seemed to be calling others to come too and i should have been glad if their voices had been heard for i was afraid the chaplain's appeal would hardly be heeded and that the benches of the little church would be three parts empty but on gently pushing the door open i found at once that my fears were baseless the church was in fact too small to hold all the soldiers who had come long before the appointed hour as soon as they had heard the bells begin and now i had no fears about the church being empty i wondered how i was going to find a place myself i stood on the doorstep undecided on tiptoe looking over the heads of all those standing men to see whether there was any corner unoccupied where i could enjoy the beauty of the unexpected sight in peace the nave was almost dark the expense of lighting had no doubt to be considered for several days past no candle or taper was to be had for money and no doubt the kindness of a motorist of the red cross had been appealed to for the supply of all the candles which lit up the altar this was indeed resplendent the vestry had been ransacked for candlesticks and the tabernacle was surrounded by a splendid aureole of light all this increased the touching impression i felt on entering against the brilliant background of the choir stood out the black forms of several hundreds of men standing looking towards the altar absolute silence reigned over the whole congregation of soldiers and yet no discipline was enforced there was no superior present to impose a show of devotion left to themselves they all understood what they had to do they crowded together waiting in silence and without any impatience for the ceremony to begin suddenly a white figure came towards me through the crowded ranks of soldiers he extended his arms in token of welcome and i at once recognized the chaplain in his surplice his face was beaming with pleasure and his eyes shone behind his spectacles he appeared to be supremely happy this way monsieur le officer this way i have thought of everything you must have the seat of honour follow me i followed the holy man who elbowed a way for me up the crowded aisle he had reserved all the choir stalls for the officers before the war they had been occupied at high mass by the clergy the choir and the principal members of the congregation he proudly showed me into one of them and i felt rather embarrassed at finding myself suddenly in a blaze of light between an artillery lieutenant and a surgeon major the low vestry door now opened and a very unexpected procession appeared in front of a bearded priest walked four artillerymen in uniform one of them carried a censer and another the incense box the other two walked in front of them arms crossed and eyes front the whole procession knelt before the altar with perfect precision and i saw beneath the priest's vestments muddy gaiters of the same kind as those worn by the gunners at the same time we heard quite close to us strains of music which seemed to us celestial in the dim light i had not noticed the harmonium but now i could distinguish the artist who was enchanting us by his skill in drawing sweet sounds from a poor worn instrument he was an artillery captain at once all eyes were turned towards him we were all enraptured none of us dared to hope that we should lift our voices in the hymns the organist seemed unconscious of his surroundings the candle placed near the keyboard cast a strange light upon the most expressive of heads against the dark background of the church the striking features of a noble face were thrown into strong relief a forehead broad and refined an aristocratic nose a fair moustache turned up at the ends and notably 
two fine blue eyes which without a glance at the fingers of the keys were fixed on the vaulted roof as though seeking inspiration there the chaplain turning to the congregation then said my friends we will all join in singing o salataris the harmonium gave the first notes and I braced myself to endure the dreadful discords I expected from the crowd of soldiers, mostly reservists, who, I supposed, had come together that evening mainly out of curiosity. Judge of my astonishment. At first only a few timid voices joined the chaplains, but after a minute or so a marvel happened. From all those chests came a volume of sound which I could hardly have believed possible. Who will say then that our dear France had lost her faith? Who can believe it? Every one of these men joined in singing the hymn, and not one of them seemed ignorant of the Latin words. It was a magnificent choir, under a lofty vault, chanting with the fervour of absolute sincerity. There was not one discordant note, not one voice out of tune, to spoil its perfect harmony. Who can believe that men, many of them more than thirty years old, would remember all the words unless they had been brought up in the faith of their ancestors, and still held it? I could not help turning to look at them. In the light of the candles their faces appeared to be wonderfully transfigured. Not one of them expressed irony or even indifference. What a fine picture it would have made for a Rembrandt! The bodies of the men were invisible in the darkness of the nave, and their heads alone emerged from the gloom. The effect was grand enough to fascinate the most sceptical of painters. It soothed and charmed one, and wiped out all the miseries that the war had left in its wake. Men like these would be equal to anything, ready for anything, and I myself should have liked to see a Monsieur Hamas hidden away in some corner of that church. Meanwhile the sacred office was proceeding at the altar. At any other time we might have smiled at the sight of that soldier-priest served by choristers of thirty-five in uniform. At that ceremony it was inexpressibly touching and attractive and it was especially delightful to see how carefully and precisely each performed his function that the ceremony might not lack its accustomed pomp. When the singing had ceased, the chaplain went up to the holy table. In a voice full of feeling he tried to express his gratitude and happiness to all those brave fellows. I should not imagine him to be a brilliant speaker at the best of times, but on that occasion the worthy man was completely unintelligible. His happiness was choking him. He tried in vain to find the words he wanted, used the wrong ones, and only confused himself by trying to get them right. But nobody had the least desire to laugh when to conclude his address, he said with a sigh of relief. And now we will tell twenty beads of the rosary, ten for the success of our arms, and the other ten in memory of the soldiers who have died on the field of honour. Hail, Mary, full of grace. I looked round the church once more and every one's lips were moving, silently accompanying the priest's words. Opposite us I saw the artillery captain take a rosary out of his pocket and tell the beads with dreamy eyes, and when the chaplain came to the sentence, Holy Mary, Mother of God, hundreds of voices burst forth, deep and manly voices, full of fervour, which seemed to proclaim their faith in him who was present before them on the altar, and also to promise self-sacrifice, and devotion to that other sacred thing, their country. Then, after the tantum ergo had been sung with vigour, the priest held up the monstrance, and I saw all those soldiers with one accord kneel down on the stone floor and bow their heads. The silence was impressive. Not a word, not a cough, and not a chair moved. I had never seen such devotion in any church. Some spiritual power was brooding over the assemblage, and bowing all those heads in token of submission and hope. Good, brave soldiers of France, how we love and honour you at such moments, and what confidence your chiefs must feel when they lead such men to battle. We sat at table around the lamp, and good Maman Cheverad had just brought in the steaming soup. Right away towards the east we heard the dull roll of the cannon. Good Monsieur Cheverad had just brought up from his cellar a venerable bottle of his best burgundy, and, at the invitation of the captain, he sat down to drink a glass with us, smoking his cherry-wood pipe, and listening with delight to our merry chat. Gossett was in his kitchen next door, preparing a delicious piece of beef a la mode, and at the same time telling the admiring Maman Cheveret about his exploits of the past month. 
we heard the men in the first troop cracking their jokes in the yard as they ate their rations and emptied their pannikin of wine under a brilliant moon down in the valley on the banks of the murmuring vessel songs and laughter floated up to us from the artillery park and the village itself shining under the starlit sky seemed bathed in an atmosphere of cheerfulness courage and confidence end of chapter 5 recording by fnh visit www.bookranger.co.uk